Well, welcome uh, to the JSky Clinical Conversations. We're going to be talking about a paper that was just published uh, entitled Outcomes of Transcatheter Pulmonary Valve Replacement and Surgical Pulmonary Valve Replacement, a Cohort ana Analysis. I have a fantastic uh, panelist here uh, with uh, Crit, who's our first author, uh, John Cheatham, who's probably the world's best expert in transcatheter valves, and uh, Gary Raff, who's uh, a, a congenital heart surgeon. Uh, my name is Frank Ng. I'm Chief of the Division of Pediatric Cardiology at UC Davis, and I would like to have uh, the other panelists introduce themselves. Hello, uh, my name is Crit Vikram, and you can call me uh, for short as a Crit. I am now a chief of the Pete's Cardiology and uh, Adult Congenital Heart Clinic at the Siderat Hospital at uh, Mahidon uh, University, Bangkok, Thailand. I am Gary Raff. I'm one of the congenital heart surgeons at UC Davis, and I'm the uh, co-director of the Heart Center here with Frank. Uh, I'm John Cheatham. I was the former uh, co-director of the Heart Center and director of cardiac catheterization at Nationwide Children's Hospital. I kind of uh, relinquished a lot of those roles and uh, I'm Professor Emeritus uh, at, o at Ohio State University and trying to semi slow down. <laughs> Isn't it the Ohio State? Yeah, the Ohio State. Yeah. <laughs> that, that will be tough to slow down, John. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start with Crit uh, uh, presenting a summary of his paper and then I'll launch to a discussion among the panelists. Go ahead, Crit. Thank you so much uh, again for allowing me uh, for opportunity to present it. So this is a comparison paper, if you will, on the transcatheter pulmonary valve and uh, surgical pulmonary valve. So we are a group of, uh, as you can see, several authors here that are from several departments. In the same uh, faculty of medicine, I also has my former fellow here also. So we work closely with our surgeon in, as a heart team and try to come up and try to really, really look into what is going on and what should be their measurable outcome and comparison with the same different treatment for the same procedure, which means a pulmonic valve replacement. So the objective is to at least uh, follow up a uh, retrospective patient for two years at the medium follow up. So we have now total of 215 patients, 72 of them are transcatheter pulmonary valve and 143 of them surgical pulmonary valve. So that we trace the data back in 2010 to 2021. Interestingly, when I look it, into our data, the pulmonary valve replacement in our hospital actually has been done sporadically. That means very few cases before 2018. After 2018, I believe the guideline on the AHA has allowed us more uh, evidence base of changing the valve and the surgeon are now buying to doing the valve also. So every number pick up after 2018. So the, the picture here illustrated the indication for pulmonary valve replacement according to the ACC and AHA guidelines. So all of the patients underwent uh, what, what would you all know as a heart team conference to see that which patient will be suitable for which valve. And this is a picture depicted uh, one of the patients as a briefly uh, procedure for the transcendental valve that mean that we do the angiography. Obviously, we have to do several imaging uh, prior to that, do the balloon sizings, and then putting the valve. Uh, for the interest of time, I will not go to the procedure itself unless uh, we come up with a discussion. So what do we have here in, uh, in Thailand now? On the left side, on the slide here, you can see this is all transcatheter valve. In the world now, they are now separated into either balloon expandable as a melody valve, as you all know, has been done and used it since 2010 after the FDA approved. However, had a limitation for the uh, patient with the native outflow up to only 24 millimeter. The second one here, I understand that the Edward Sapien has been uh, FDA approved for uh, valve in valve or in a conduit. But however, in our country, we had a uh, special access and able to do the patient in the native outflow also. So this is the valve that we use the most now and has the most experience. On the right side here of the panel, uh, on the left one here is a pasta valve. This is from Korea now waiting for the CE mark. It's from the na or can be done either in the native or the conduit with less than 32 millimeter. And on the right side here is a 
um, Venus P Valve, I understand just uh, just recently has approval for the CE mark. However, the limitation still in the native outflow of around no more than 32 and in some cases, maybe 34 millimeter. On the right side here is a surgical valve. What I show you in the picture here is a Gore-Tex valve. This is a hand suture valve. So our surgeon had a uh, uh, researched and looked into the durability of the valve and they come up with uh, one of the Japanese paper that's using a Gothic valve hand suture so this is the hand suture valve so what they're doing is a suture in ahead of the procedure and they put it in for restore and then we, they can use it case by case now and this is the valve that has been used most in our patient now the other three valves are commercially available valves as you can have in anywhere. It's like Perimal Magna, Contigra, or Homograph. So I apologize for a very busy slide here. So with comparison, as a table here, uh, table one as also in the paper, we have 72 patients in the column on the left side here on the transgender valve and 143 on the surgical valve. The number on the 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 black uh, color uh, number here that indicated patient uh, comparison who has a significant statics statistically significant. You can see that in the translator, the patient seem to be younger and have less duration of the time after primary repair to pulmonary valve replacement. They have less arrhythmia, more or less. They has more conduit in this group. So we able to rehabilitate the conduit and put the valve in transgenitally. And then so they have more pulmonary stenosis. The percentage is a little bit uh, higher, 27.8% 27, 27 compared to 14% in the surgical valve. Obviously, it seems like the patient who have surgical uh, pulmonary valve has a more severe pulmonary regurgitation. If we indicated that by the volume sizing of the right uh, endoscopic volume measurement by the cardiac MRI. Now, the next slide here, it's a, it's a valve that we actually put on. On the left side here, it's a native and a conduit, and this is the valve. So we put uh, more majority of the valve on the Edward Sapien valve, which we have the most uh, experience here. And on the right side, obviously, this is a Gore-Tex valve. About 81 patients and 81 patients has a Gore-Tex valve. Now, what we actually found in the paper that we did not expect it to see is that the size of the valve that we put it. So uh, the, the reason we look into this is because the, one of the original paper look into the normal size of the pulmonic valve in, in a human, male or female, and they come up with that we should not have anything less than 26 millimeter for the right valve alpha track uh, size or the pulmonic valve. So that is 26. So if we comparison in all sides, so the one on the left side here is a transgender valve and the one on the right side here is a surgical valve. Now, in our institute, so when I discuss with the surgeon, uh, the, the limitation of the Gothic is the size of the conduit that's come up with only uh, 24 millimeter. So you can see that majority of them are 24. So even we use a pearly mount, usually they pick 26 millimeter. So that's mean that there are certain limitation for the surgical pulmonic valve in, in this paper <coughs> from what we found. However, in the transitive valve for the native outflow, we are able to put up to around 29 millimeter as a median valve size. So what we find out is that Yes, we can do transgender valves, and yes, in the native outflow, we can put a little bit larger size of the valve. So when I we can discuss this later, when so when we discuss with our surgeon why why we cannot put a much larger valve, they they explain that sometimes it's a little bit difficult to to start up putting the very large valve because usually in the right front outflow track, sometimes it's compressed with the sternum, and if you put the valve too far way down in the pulmonary artery. So you will sometimes will compromise the bifurcation. So this is something that we find out. Now, why do we send for a patient for the surgery? We have to admit that not all the patient who will need pulmonary valve replacement will be suitable for transgender. We have seen that almost 25%, they have a concomitant surgery. Now we can discuss that this concomitant number, which is very high, maybe related to the very long period of the waiting time 
after the first surgery until we see the patient have pulmonary regurgitation, until the RV site is growing, and then they have more leakage of other valves. So, but around 13 patients, we have concomitant tricuspid valve annuloplasty in this patient. Around half of them, around 49%, we send for the surgeon because the valve site is a 32 milliliter. This is quite obvious because at the current uh, manufacturing or development of the transmitter valve is limited to around 30 to 32, whatever valve that we choose. The other 10%, which is, is explanted a while, that means we are not able to rehabilitate that good enough outflow tag or large enough outflow tag of this valve, and that we can comfortably put in the transitor valve. And then there are some 10%, which is a complex anatomy, and maybe 5% of the core compression, and maybe 1.5% of air decompression. Now, what we, interestingly, for the patient who explain of the conduit, we have six mortality that we can discuss it. And, and I go through each one of them with the data and we found out that it, it usually, even the bypass time are not that much different between patient who's dead or survived the surgery. However, the hospitalization, it's much longer and much uh, uh, ICU time. So when we comparison on the transitive valve and surgical valve, this is a time for procedure. Uh, the fural time, procedure time, as a for trans catheter and the cross cam and bypass time for the surgical valve. What we see the difference obviously is the hospitalization day. That as I just explained it, six of the eight that is from the explant of the conduit. And uh, we call it a major complication. So in our, our paper, we separate into a, a two category, but this is a number that we lump. One category is a major events that need either CPR, carbonyl pulmonary resuscitation, post pericardiotomy reintubation, but basically it's prolonged hospitalization more than expected. The other thing is for the patient who, who need redo, reopen or recatheterization for whatever reason, as you can see it a little bit higher on the surgical part. Uh, interestingly, the inequalities are not much different. This is the immediately after surgery. Uh, in the paper, it's all show that after two years, the number are not that much different also. So this is my last slide now, and the key highlight. So what we find out, obviously, as you can see that the transitive pulmonary valve result in a lower mortality with a future, fewer major adverse events than the surgical valve. So mortality is high in the patient who explain the conduit. So I think this will emphasize that as in the ESC guideline, class one indication for transitive valve, that if you can actually, if you can rehabilitate the conduit, then you Transcendental pulmonary valve should be a good choice or even a better choice than surgical pulmonary valve. Now, the second one that we find out in this paper that the transcendental valve allow a larger diameter of the pulmonary valve implants, which can positively impact the pulmonary valve function. So that's mean that we can we are able to put in the median size of 29 millimeter valve versus for 24 millimeter valve for the surgical one. So this is the first study that involved four types of the valve, Melody, Edwards, Venus, and the Pausta now. So we are now up to around 80 valves. Now at, on the paper, it's around 72. We have around 83 valves now in the same cohort. And I think surgical has a very good role in the patient who have a larger outflow for now, and also patient who have a required concomitant surgery or either explant of the conduit. And sometimes there is a necessity to resect part of the RV out for who has, who, which has a very large aneurysm. Uh, I did not show in the slide uh, uh, because of, of the limitation of time, but we also found that when we look at the QRS regression duration as a silicate endpoint for an RV volume uh, measurement by the MRI, we have seen that there are uh, better regression of the QRS duration in uh, transitive pulmonary valve when compared to surgical valve. So I think this is, uh, for now, this is a summary of this paper, and thank you so much. Uh, excellent summary, Crit. Um, so now this is a large volume study involving a single center, and obviously there are three of us who are interventional cardiologists here. So uh, Gary, maybe uh, I can throw the question out to you first, and then John, you can jump on as well, as well as Crit. Um, what do you think of this paper as a congenital surgeon? You know, it's, uh, I think it mimics the experience at 
most centers have. There's a cohort of patients who just are not going to be candidates for surgical replacement of whatever their right ventricular outflow tract was before. And um, those patients tend to have other issues as well. There was a high proportion of patients in this study that needed concomitant surgery as well, whether it be the tricuspid valve, et cetera. And the incidence of arrhythmias, I think is probably related to the size of the RV uh, as well in these patients. So that's very similar to what we see here. So I think th what you've described is very representative of what we're doing uh, here as well. I don't know our exact numbers, Frank, of, uh, of valves that we're putting in right now, interventional versus surgical, but uh, I would bet we're very similar. Any thoughts, John or Crit? Yeah, I'm doing it uh, because Crit, Crit has a lot of thoughts because since he wrote the paper and everything, I guess, I guess there's a couple of things uh, I would say is that, uh, I mean, you made a statement earlier about, you know, kind of the valve that has been decided the valve size for the pulmonary was 26 millimeters, right, from previous study and everything. So I guess the question, when I read it, I thought kind of the surgeons got a little bit of a bum deal on this thing by comparing valve size. Because first of all, at no time did anyone ever talk about what is the valve made of? In other words, the, the 29 millimeter sapien is a bovine pericardial valve which is much thicker. And the EOA of that is not the same as a porcine pericardial valve or a bovine jugular valve. So it's not just, unless we're talking about revalving the size, we have, to, we have to take everything in consideration of what the valve uh, leaflets are made out of. Uh, because uh, again, revalving, yes, 26 mil, if you have a smaller valve to revalve is more difficult. So I, I, and I guess the surgeons make the choice of what valve size they want. It's, and I know you made a comment that your surgeon said, well, if it's too close to the pulmonary bifurcation or so-and-so, but I mean, again, that's depending upon how long they've made the Gore-Tex tube, uh, right? And Gary, you can chime in. So I, I think that if the surgeon wanted to put in a bigger valve, they could, if we wanted to say, oh, you know, they could not put just 24s, but they could put 29s or 28, whatever. So that, that's just one thing, I think. Again, I think the composition of the valve is important uh, as well as the diameter of the valve. Yeah, I think really we're talking about two different populations of patients, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, but that's the reality of what we see. And so when we're in the operating room, let, let's forget the patients who are there for other procedures as well, the tricuspids, the mazes, whatever. Um, when we're trying to put a valve in, uh, at least our, our practice here is to put in the largest valve that we can. And oftentimes we're thinking that for the next replacement, we'd like to set things up so it could be done in the cath lab. So in order to do that, I can't put a 23 millimeter uh, perimount in because that's not gonna work hemodynamically for the majority of patients. So, uh, you know, a homograft is great. Um, certainly as large a, a supported valve as I can get in there is what I'm going to use. And uh, trying to set up the, uh, even the bifurcation for a valve later ends up, I think, being really important. The, the dialogue in my mind over the years is, is really gonna change to how can we set these patients up surgically for a better transcatheter result down the road? You know, may, may I ask one question, Gary? At, at yeah. the moment now, what was your preferable valve and what size? Uh, it's dependent on the patient anatomy or how do, how do yeah. you choose? It, it, a lot of it really depends on what they have to begin with. For the most part, if a patient it, at, at UC Davis is a candidate for a transcatheter valve, that's what they're going to get. Uh, if they are there for other procedures or if the uh, outflow tract is too large. And for the most part, those are patients who had a transannular patch previously. Um, then the, the options really are gonna be probably a, uh, a supported biologic valve, like the perimount, as large as, as I feel is safe to put in. Uh, or, you know, Frank and I have even uh, tried to do a, a hybrid to put in a, uh, 
you know, a transcatheter valve where we do a sternotomy and we're uh, decreasing the size of the RV outflow tract so that mm -hmm. that valve can sit in it. I have to say the, the, um, I, I agree with John in that in some sense, the surgeon's got a bum deal here in this analysis because it, you know, you're starting off with, I just found it interesting that you have four options on the transcatheter valve and there's only one option on the surgical valve. So yeah, of course the, the, the data is going to show the limitations of the surgeons uh, in this regard. The, I also thought that because you, you're an interventional cardiologist. And obviously I, I thought there might have been some selection bias here as well, right? What I mean by that is um, if you look at the, you, this was a, a, a number of patients uh, gathered over a 10, 12 year period. Uh, was there any differences in terms of when surgical valves started and when the transcatheter valve started? Obviously um, the, the transcatheter valves came later. Now, could that later start time have uh, given better results just because you've had more experience with transcatheter valve, I mean, with, with pulmonary valve replacements and you learn from the mistakes of the previous cases. And so therefore you um, just get better results later on. That's just one thought. Um, I also noted you had said that uh, in your paper, there was in general about a five, 6% uh, mortality, but the general data there was about a one, one and a half percent mortality. So that's you know, almost four to five times fold increase in mortality. So is this more of a comment about the surgical experience as opposed to um, the, the, the world data, real world data? Can you comment on that? Yes. Okay. Let's, let me summary the question. So the, the first one is that I, I, I like to sort of reset the, the tones a little bit. So this, this is not a paper to, to try to compete uh, that surgical or transitor, which one is better. I think it will have to coexist anyway. And as you can see, our data, two thirds of the patient that totally had the wow actually had a surgical wow. So that's that's one thing. And now let, let me set the tone back a little bit. And, and I, I'm not a surgeon, but when I discuss with them, our surgeon might is try to see that they can create the valve that actually lasts long. This is in their mind. So they come up with a cortex tube instead of using commercially available, we were able to be to assess perimal also, and several of our surgeons uh, putting the perimal, actually do, using the Gortex, well, when I discussed with them, they say that it's actually more difficult because you have to suture both proximal and both distal instead of mounting the valve. Gary may be able to explain this better than me. And instead of mounting and suture one time, you actually have to sort of like suture the tube. So, so they, they're trying so hard to, to try to say that the valve is durable. Now, the, the reason because of the redo procedure are a little bit difficult. Now, come to the second question. I, I think the, the thing that we have seen a little bit higher mortality, maybe if you look in our data, uh, the regular index volume are actually quite high, much, much higher than the recommendation uh, on the ACC HA guideline. In, in this part of the region, the, the waiting time for the surgical, sometime over a year, one or two years. That's mean even you when you started to get into the heart valve and say that, okay, the patient will need surgical valve. They will not get it tomorrow. Sometimes they get it more than 12 months down the road. So that this is one of the things that actually uh, creating. I, I had to admit that uh, on partly when we look back at the data, we have seen that the surgical patient actually, if you will, we can call it's like a sicker patient. I mean, they have a higher volume, they have a concomitance. So I would take the John Wood said, get a bum deal because they got a sicker patient to, to begin <laughs> with. Not that we, we actually work with them and, and, and actually they are, they are now looking into us and say that, well, can, now the, the reason because in, in our region, we don't have a limitation of only putting wow in wow. So we have more liberty of doing valve in the native outflow. So, so as actually you can see that two third of our patient is a native outflow, not, not, not a conduit patient. So I, I think we coexist. And I think the, the surgical actually had a, a proven reliability, a durability wow that uh, they are really, really, really believe in the Gothics. So we, we started this in around 2018, as you can see that 
I, I had maybe 20% of data, which is before 2018, and around 80% of the data of the patient after 2018. And we have seen a growing number, both surgical and transgender. And actually, the number on the surgical and transgender in the last two years is about equally both surgical and transgender now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I yeah, can, can I just ask, did I understand you say you cannot do valve in valve or you can do? Is that, is that we can do valve in valve. Okay. But, okay. but the Edwards valve or other valve are allowed to do in the native outflow. So we had in, in our patient, in our, yeah, in yeah, our yes, data, right. we had six valve in valve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I appreciate uh, all of you saying what a bum deal the surgeons have gotten, but I don't see this being like that, honestly. <laughs> We're treating sort of different patients, right? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, the the interesting thing to me with the transcatheter approach is also uh, there seemed to be the ability to operate on those patients sooner. So one of the questions I was going to ask, it's almost 10 years sooner on average, right? If you look at the age distribution, yeah. uh, is, is it a preference to do younger patients with the transcatheter as well? I think that the question may be answered. Yeah, let, let me answer first. Maybe Frank and John can help me. Um, I think the, page, the, the, the thing is that should you do it or could you do it? Obviously, the, the could you do it is that mean the, the younger patient, the smaller the RV volume, then smaller the size of the landing zone. So it will be easier. That means could we do it? So we can discuss is what is the, the gold standard for putting the valve in. So uh, that that's mean could do it. Should we do it? So I think in, in our institute, we use the guideline as you can see that uh, majority of our patient had uh, RV volume actually 160, which is at least 10 cc over the guideline. Very, very few patient had RV volume less than 150. And even when you look back, some of the, them have already 200, 220 or something. I, I don't know that what's, what is the practice in, 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 at John or Frank now, uh, which patient that you're sending for surgical, uh, on what RV volume and how you, maybe we, you can help me. Yeah, but I, so we, I, I we use a number of different things, um, and Frank can chime in as well. Uh, these patients regularly have halters, they regularly have exercise testing. And if they have evidence of symptoms, but their RV volume is not that high yet, then we'll still consider them a candidate. And on the flip side, you know, the patients who have a really large RV volume, I really worry about the compliance of the right ventricle and how much improvement they're going to get with putting a valve in. We typically will do it anyway, but I think they're very different patient groups because the physiology is very different. And that may account for some of the things that you're seeing as far mm -hmm. as the risk of the, of the procedure as well. Mm -hmm. So ideally, those patients you'd want to take to the cath lab rather than to surgery. <laughs> but okay. we're stuck. Frank, yeah. Frank, can you explain in, in United States now, if you had a patient with, let's say that reaching the indication, how would you consider transitive valve in what patient? Because I understand that the choice is a little bit limited. For a, we're, we're discussing on the native outflow now. Yeah, it's, how would you go with that? So we're moving into the so the next question, which is great. You know, obviously we have a couple of the. I mean, you've sort of showed some of that and the um, the Venus P uh, and the Posta. Uh, you know, we have the Harmony and as well as the Altera now that's coming into the market. Um, and so I think that we're you know the ability to actually get into the larger outflow tracks are are going to be in increased uh, and it's going to as people get more experience and confidence this is going to be uh, a big uh, help for that group of patients um, we tend to uh, as Gary said you know go through all the different testing to to look for hysterythmias clinical symptoms and of course the the MRI can be very useful now you know the publications uh, if you look at the RV the volumes that are used as a cross to uh, intervention is pretty wide right I mean I think there's the, on one, so anywhere from 120 to 180 even. Um, and so we've tended to be a little more on the aggressive side. I think that that if, if, if there's any symptoms and we, we get close to 120, uh, 130, uh, we're already talking about 
thinking how how can we put a new valve in obviously the size is a big deal you talked about could we and should we and yeah that's a huge question and i think each institution is going to have a little bit of different uh, approach to that given the the uh, the the, uh, the stakeholders the, the interventionists and the surgeons Hey, John, you've traveled the world uh, uh, on this uh, topic. What are your thoughts about, you know, how the, the variations uh, around the world uh, in, in this, uh, regarding this question? Yeah, I think you already made a comment. Uh, you, you mentioned two valves that we have available to us in the United States, uh, the Harmony valve and now the Altera more recently uh, for the native uh, uh, outflow tract with primary pulmonary, severe pulmonary regurgitation, not a conduit, as a matter of fact. They weren't approved for conduits. Uh, so we have that experience. And then outside the United States, just what Crit said is that it's particularly in Asia, but also South America, but more in Asia, they have available just like the Polsta from Korea and the, the Venus P from China, the Medzines PT valve also in China. So the, all of those valves, uh, which uh, except for the uh, Sapien, which is the Altera, that's the valve that goes in, are all porcine pericardial valves, self-expandable frames. I, I personally believe the self-expandable frames are the way to go for native outflow track, for conformability, for ability also to put in, you know, potentially larger valves going down the road, thinking of valve and valve. And I guess one of the things that I, I worry a little bit about is, and, and Gary can make a comment about this, there's a reason besides the fact they can't fit it in that, that the surgeons don't put in a 32, 34 millimeter valve in the pulmonary. It wasn't designed, the pulmonary, it was not designed for that size valve. And some people have shown, first of all, if you put the valve in the wrong location, or if you put it too big, it comes out not so good. Just like we found now with the Sapien, if you underexpand it, that's not so good, right? Because you get more likely to get stenosis. So I think that I'm, I'm trying to figure out about the size of valves. I think that we're going to all, uh, the first, the next go around for all of us uh, around the world is just what we've talked about. The two valves we have now in the United States, the three valves that they have outside the United States, and we're going to get a lot more experience. But I think the next step is going to be talking about longevity of valves, changing a valve. The valves we use today are not going to be the valves we're going to use in the future. And I think and if we can adapt whatever technology that is to the, the, the tools that we currently have, whether it's in the OR, because there's some surgical valves that are undergoing trials right now with different valve tissue, uh, tissue, uh, you know, tissue engineered, et cetera, and also um, in our world as well. So I think that we're, we're, doing, we're gonna be able to do a lot more than we're doing now. Uh, hopefully everybody in the world, transcatheter-wise, will get to do those five valves we just talked about, but that's not going to be the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is going to be valve longevity, the tissue, and, and also just, and I'll get Gary's shaking, nodding. Yeah, absolutely. I totally, totally agree, John. Um, yeah. You know, the other thing that I always find interesting is we're, when we talk about valve sizes, that has nothing to do with the physiology, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we really care about. Yeah. We care about what the valve gradients are how the RV is performing. And we want to protect that RV as much as we can over a patient's lifetime, because we mainly deal with right-sided disease and congenital heart disease. So um, those are things that uh, I think if, if you're talking about the best valve that I use, it's probably a pulmonary homograph for those patients for those reasons, you know? Um, and we're lucky that we have the ability to put in pulmonary homographs. You know what their longevity is, uh, it's pretty consistent as long as we're able to get a good size in and if it's in a native position, right? I mean, 10, 15 year, uh, you know, 80 to 85% freedom of reintervention is pretty normal for those. That's not too bad, but it's not going to be as good as when we have a bioengineered valve with the patient's own tissue, oh, right? Yeah, I, I think that we're jumping into the sort of the, the, the next yeah, <laughs> question is really the future, and I think that certainly with the the uh, all these new valves coming into the transcatheters coming into the market, the next question is really uh, what are the longevity and what's the long term data on these new valves? And as uh, you guys had alluded to, yeah, um, you know the valves we have now are not going to be the valves in the future, and we're constantly going to come up with new ideas. Um, Gary, can can you talk a little bit about? 
uh, the future on surgical valves. I know there's been a lot of discussion about can we put in a valve surgically that can be further expanded, uh, so forth. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that that certainly the, uh, the bioengineered valves that that people are starting to really uh, be able to bring to some experimental trial in in humans or non-human primates, etc. Um, you know, those have a lot of promise. I think we're at least 10, 15 years out before we, we really understand that better. And we truly see that um, every, every year, I think there's going to be something better around the corner and it just takes too much time. But, you know, ideally the valve that we, we want surgically is one that's going to limit this patient population that we're all dealing with now. You know, a valve that I can put in a patient with truncus arteriosus that will grow with that patient that we won't need to intervene on in more than half the patients. That would be the ideal valve that we want, that we all want. You know, um, that I, I would say I'm not going to see that in my lifetime, honestly, but uh, hopefully I'm wrong. Your thoughts? Yeah. yeah, Frank, I was going to say, um, I, it, it, and Gary's probably right about lifetime on some of these things we're talking about having been a part of. Uh, a tissue engineered uh, valve that we work with the, as the guys at, at Nationwide, where they're using also for, for um, uh, tube grafts and Fontan completion. It's a, a tissue engineered from uh, bone marrow and they're doing that. But the valves, again, Boston tried to, has been doing, trying to do this for decades. And it's, it's difficult for the shear and the wear and tear on the valve. I also uh, worked a little bit with some of the bioengineers at Ohio, the Ohio State University, and they were doing uh, hyaluron polymer, uh, which looked like plastic to me. And I said, this is never going to work. You know, so we did some sheep work with that. And then I'm on the DSMB for the, uh, 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 the uh, valve with the endogenous tissue restoration uh, that's surgically implanted. Mark is involved with gore, gore, with gore with a couple of valves that surgically implanted. Uh, but there are more conduits that are going to, the size itself is going to be a limitation, I think, in the future. The valve leaflets are different. So I think that there, there are going to be, there's going to be, pro I think there's going to be progress for sure. And I hope, it, but whatever it is, it has to be uh, molded to the, the either play, putting in by a transcatheter method or from a surgical method. John, wow. yeah. from what I understand, uh, when we, I talk to our surgeon, uh, they mentioned a couple of things. One thing is that the, the Gore-Tex valve, which I, I understand that you have not mentioned this, but I think John know a lot most on the material wise has probably the longest yes. 10, 15 years out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the second part is that the homograph, as Gary said, that uh, used to be a, a most preferable valve now in, in that choice, but it seems like they got a lot of calcification and, and the size that we actually able to acquire in this part of the region are not as liberal as Gary might, might would have. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the transcatheter valve now, the, the only Edwards valve that I can find out the data, but this is a data from the TAVI, which is more than five years. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen the melody long term, but the other self expandable valve are relatively short, two or three years. How how would we as a community will make adjustment on which valve at at the moment rather than the future? How would you guide us, John? Which valve well, did you choose? Yeah, I mean, what you said and what your surgeons uh, chose was the the data out of Japan, who really popularized the Gore-Tex valves. I mean, other people have individually, but as a community in Japan, they've done that. And, and I think there's, and you know, there's kind of a little bit different tweaks on the Gore-Tex, not all Gore-Tex is the same, but yeah, the calcification rate, blah, 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 and things are, are much better, uh, it seems like. And what Gary said though, is very important is he said pulmonary homograph. He didn't say aortic homograph, he said pulmonary, and that's way different. The, the outcomes and the longevity for a pulmonary homograph versus an aortic homograph. And there continues to be papers to show that. But I, I if you're asking me, do I think that Gore-Tex, if you're saying right now, what, you know, we don't have a transcatheter Gore-Tex valve yet. Uh, we've talked to Gore about that for a number of years <laughs> uh, to do that, but we, we, we do not have such a valve uh, 
and that might be that might be a better valve for us, uh, but it's not a, no one's making that. And what we're really talking about is go beyond Gore-Tex, either a valve that grows with that person because it's their valve, or a material that's far superior than Gore-Tex that we'll find out is better than Gore-Tex. But so, yeah, I would mm -hmm. use the analogy that in surgery we use technology that's 2000 years old, right? We're using yeah. suture the Egyptians used. Yeah. Gore-Tex has been around a long time. There's gotta be something better up the pipe. <laughs> hey guys, we're at the end of the hour and this was an excellent discussion on an excellent paper. So congratulations to Crit and thank you for participating as John and Gary. Uh, thanks guys. Thank you.